Uh, the other thing that's coming up pretty soon is the redistricting process. Every 10 year arcane process that determines the shape of state legislative and congressional districts, that'll be coming up in 2011. So uh, this legislative round will not impact that directly, but you get some incumbents in place who are more likely to win next time. And it's gonna put the governor in place who's going to preside over the next redistricting. Uh, presumably he or she doesn't die in office. Okay. Um, all right, so that, you know, so let's, uh, all right, so anyway, they'll say legislature controls all sorts of stuff that matters to us all the time, so it should matter. All right, uh, the first thing you want to think about when you're thinking about state legislative elections is contestation. And contestation, I'm talking about does each party have a candidate in a given race? If you've got a, can if you've got a race for state legislature and uh, there's only a Democrat in it or there's only a Republican in it, there's no choice for the voters and there's no possibility, uh, barring a remote write-in possibility, uh, that the other candidate is going to win, or the other party is going to win. Basically, if you don't win, uh, you can't play. And this year uh, in Illinois, of the 118 House races, only 66 of those have a Republican and a Democrat in them in the general election. And in the Senate, of the 39 seats that are up for election, uh, only 19 are contested. So about half of the districts and legislative districts in the state have two a, a Democrat and Republican running in, in that so that the candidate or the voter in the general election actually has a choice. Um, so um, in, in fact, if the GOP won every single Senate seat that they are contesting, they still wouldn't win a majority uh, because they just don't have enough uh, en enough people in sitting seats and in the, in the seats coming up. Um, okay. Uh, now, given this, you may, you know, you may, some of you may think, oh, yes, that's the way it always is. Half the seats, nobody's running, or nobody in the other party is running in, or some of you may be aghast by that. Uh, but regardless, um, if that's the situation, a big part of, say, legislative races, it has to do with targeting and trying to figure out where you expend your resources. Uh, because, uh, you, you know, there's a limited amount of resources, you know, except you know, if a couple of governor's races we're looking at right now. But there's a, for a state legislative race, there's always a limited amount of resource. So you, gotta fig you have to figure out where you're going to spend that money and those time and resources strategically uh, to let you be most likely to win close races. You don't want to waste your money on races you're never going to win. You don't want to waste your money on races you're definitely going to win. What you want to do is focus your money and your time and your energy on the races that could go either way because that's where you're gonna get the most marginal bang for your buck. And, and that leads to this uh, issue of targeting that uh, the, the parties will sit down and figure out, the individual candidates, they all wanna win, but the parties at a, at a higher level uh, will say, well, where do we wanna put our resources, right? We, got, we know Joe Blow's gonna win, we're not gonna give him any money. We know, you know Nancy uh, Pelosi is gonna win over here, we're not, we're, or she's gonna lose, we're not gonna give her any money. Uh, but what, which ones are the ones uh, that are in, in the middle? And they make these decisions pretty straightforward. I mean, the Rauner Party, the governor's campaign, has effectively abandoned the Senate GOP right now. They're not giving the Senate GOP any money at all. Uh, they're basically the governor's banking all of his money on legislative races on the House, which is, probably makes sense because there's more of a chance that they would take over the House and the Senate. But you know, the fact that there's an existential impossibility of taking over the Senate, just the fact, you know, it's, it's slightly more positive than that for the, Demo for the Republicans in the House. Uh, so that's where they're putting all the money, and it fits with Rauner's sort of anti-Madigan uh, story that he's been marketing for several years now, too. Um, so let's take a look at some of these target races and see what's going on. And first of all, I should say, we don't know exactly where the target races are yet, because what's, well, we're in a process right now, so the probing stage, we're getting to the end of that now, where basically the, the parties will, they, they preliminarily target certain races. They say, well, this could be it. And then they'll oftentimes will we'll put some money in, they'll put a, send out some mailers, they'll put some ads out, and then they do some follow-up polling to see if they can move the, the numbers. If they can move them in the way they want, then they might you know, put more resources. And if they can't, then they abandon that one maybe and go to some other one. So what now I'm talking about are the sort of preliminarily uh, targeted races, the ones that they seem to be at least probing in at the moment. Um, okay. 
Oh, there it is. Okay, so here, oops, oh, this thing's lagging on me, so let's back it up. Oops, wrong way. There it is, now we're good. All right, so here's the downstate races uh, highlighted in this excellent graphic uh, uh, that I produced uh, yesterday. Uh, the yellow are the, uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, contested, or the, the, the not contested, the uh, targeted, preliminarily targeted races. On the left, yes, is uh, the Senate and on the right is the House. And you can see in the Senate, downstate, there's only two Senate races where anybody's having any competition whatsoever. One of these happens to be a Democratic seat uh, down in the middle of downstate, Andy Menar, getting a, a, uh, you know, uh, a good contest down there. On the right, you see the House. And here we have five down seat, downstate uh, seats that are starting to look like there might be a contest. Um, so in other words, a takeaway from this is or a couple, and also the downstate, the two downs, two of the five downstates are Democrats, three of them are Republicans currently. Um, the takeaway on this is downstate's not where the action is in the state legislative races. There's been a lot of change in downstate over the years, especially in the very southern part of the state, but mostly that's all shaken out now. And so on a parties, partisan basis, pretty much there's not a lot of partisan turnover anywhere downstate, at least in this map. So there's a little bit going on there. So let's turn to the O. Let's turn to the uh, northeast. Uh, now we've seen a lot more yellow, because this is just the northeast part of the state, right? So it's, it's, it's uh, Cook County, where you see all the squiggles, uh, or the city of Chicago, where all the squiggles on the right are. I don't have a pointer. That's Chicago. And this, the, the nines are so tight is because there's so many people living there, the districts are really, really small. And as you go out into the suburbs, you get larger districts because you know, people have picket fences and, and whatnot. You don't have the 20-story high-rises cram full of 50,000 people. Um, so here, what do we see? Uh, we've got the Senate on the left and the House on the right again. And what we're seeing here is a significant amount of contestation, uh, pre preliminary targeting, in, not in Chicago. So like downstate, Chicago's not where the action is in the, prime, in the general election. It's in the collar county. It's in the suburbs. That's where the action is. That's where all these yellow uh, is. And especially if you look in the Senate one, there's a big clump. That's DuPage County. DuPage County, not that long ago, within living memory of almost everybody in this room, was one of the most Republican counties in the country. It was up there like uh, Orange County, California, or Waukesha County, Wisconsin, or what's the one in New York, Suffolk County, or whatever it is. But one of these places that just chock a block with hardcore Republicans. Uh, uh, Pate Phillip is from there. He's probably ro he's rolling over in his grave when he sees this. And they say he's not dead. But this will kill him, <laughs> right? OK. So anyway, so, so you're getting all this, and you get to the House districts in the same situation. Uh, up, you know, a little bit different spots. There's idiosyncrasies with individuals that are running. But it's by and large in the, in, the, in the burbs that we're seeing the competition. The other thing that's important to note about this, of all these competitive seats, uh, one is Democratic. All those are Republican-held seats right now. The only Democratic one, I think, is this uh, uh, Tom Cullerton uh, is a senator in, uh, in DuPage County, and they just hate to have a Democratic senator in DuPage County named John Tom Cullerton. It's not John Cullerton. He's a different guy. He's the president of the Senate. And same thing with the House. No Democrats really in much uh, uh, of a danger at all there. Uh, and then if you, if you look at this, with the, if you put the congressional map from the Northeast over top of this, the two very competitive congressional seats that we have, Randy Holkren seat and uh, uh, um, Roscombe seat, also fall more or less in the same area. Uh, uh, so there's going to be a lot of overlap there uh, between it. Uh, so overall, the House has got 14 seats that look like they're going to have action in them. Only two of them are held by de Democrats. How is it possible for the Republicans to win six, uh, the six seats they need, I think it is, to take a majority when they're only contesting two, <laughs> two, two, two places where Democrats now hold? Uh, they're basically, they're playing defense. And that's, you know, that's not the way you gain. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe that's maybe the best they can do. I don't know. Another potentially significant point, uh, the Democrats have nine women candidates running uh, in the House. Uh, versus seven for the GOP, but in every man versus woman contest, 
The woman is a Democrat and the man is a GOP. Uh, in the Senate, we've got uh, uh, you know, seven of these t t total preliminary targeted seats. Two of them are Democrats. And the Democrats have four women in these, in these races. The Republicans have zero women in these races. Um, so, uh, so the impact, um, basically it seems virtually impossible for the GOP to take over either the House or the Senate and the General Assembly in November. Uh, even if the forces, even if you know, the Trump wave and the blue wave and the whatever wave and the Kavanaugh wave, and all, even if that stuff wasn't going on, they'd still be going to have trouble. The battleground, the upshot is the battleground for this state is in the suburbs continues to be in the suburbs. And it's very much like the battleground we're seeing for the congressional races all around the country. And, and in fact, it brings us back to this woman who is the pivotal voter in the state of Illinois. She is a, uh, um, she probably lives in Lyle or Morton or Schaumburg. She's taken her kid to some organized activity in her SUV and she is a social liberal in a conservative in a fiscal sense. She doesn't like taxes, but she certainly doesn't want somebody taking away the right to choose, and she's not that concerned about immigrants and so forth. So, so she is the, the, the uh, pivotal vote, uh, and maybe the pivotal vote not only for the statewide elections, but for the chambers and for the U.S. House uh, coming up. Okay? All right, Jim? thanks. Jim? Great, thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Since I'm going to speak about the governor's race, I think I should mention that I have worked for three unindicted Illinois governors. <laughs> that may be a record. <laughs> the only three out of the last seven say. other than uh, since Quinn and, and Governor Rauner. Um, still time. This will be analytical, not partisan, and yet I have to conclude that if Rauner is reelected, I pledge to take all of you to the pump room for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Governor Rauner was elected in 2014 with 50.3% of the vote against uh, Governor Quinn, who uh, was a lackluster governor and who uh, operated under the shadow of his senior running mate, uh, defrocked Governor Blagojevich. And so he was not a strong candidate. Um, since then, Governor Rauner um, has been a um, feckless governor in the sense that he has really never developed a, a strong approach to governing and is the author of the, the three legislative sessions in which we went without a budget. And so uh, many Republicans in the suburbs in particular feel he has been an ineffective governor. But more important than that, the governor has basically lost his Republican base. Chris talked about the social liberal female voters, and uh, Governor Rauner is a social liberal. However, however his base is a conservative base, a social conservative base, and his uh, signature on a bill that he promised the cardinal to veto that would and will provide taxpayer funding for abortion outraged the social conservative uh, support that he had in the uh, Republican Party. And so the ineffectiveness of the governorship, the uh, signature on this bill that he promised to veto has generated um, or has resulted in a significant uh, lack of enthusiasm among Republicans uh, for his for his election uh, so no enthusiasm there are no no I did see one rounder sign in my downstate Western Illinois expanse where I live, but uh, uh, there are no uh, signs of enthusiasm, literal or otherwise, for the governor downstate where he would have to do well in order to be, uh, to be reelected. Um, 
I've asked several of my former students uh, who are now uh, senior lobbyists with state government uh, how well they think the governor will do. And they and I conclude that he will be fortunate to crack 40% of the vote in uh, the November election. Uh, in part because the uh, Operating Engineers Union has crafted a brilliant or adopted a, a brilliant tactic of creating the conservative party which is on the ballot and has as its uh, uh, gubernatorial candidate a Republican state senator who is a bait noir of the governor and so while nobody will know who the candidate is, a central Illinois Republican senator, uh, people going into the ballot booth who are unenthusiastic or opposed to Rauner but can't vote for Pritzker will have the option of, and it will be attractive to many of them, voting for the conservative party. As a result, uh, that party and the Libertarian Party may garner about 10% of the total vote, and that is why we think it will be difficult for Governor Rauner to uh, crack the 40% uh, threshold in his election. The governor also is, he's not a warm and fuzzy guy, and this is not a, you know, a personal criticism, it's, it's an objective criticism of style, and that is probably a factor in his uh, inability to generate enthusiasm uh, among, his, among his base. So uh, he is in a weak position. His opponent, uh, J.B. Pritzker, is not perceived from my perspective to be a strong, uh, um, charismatic, uh, exciting candidate, uh, but uh, he is supported with intense uh, fervor by organized labor, which is making it both a state and national union objective to defeat Rauner, who of course uh, was a, a central to the uh, stimulation of the Janus case related to uh, state employees and uh, whether they had to pay uh, dues to uh, employee unions. And so uh, with uh, that role that Rauner has played, uh, which is uh, in the case, which is uh, emblematic of his strong anti-public employee union uh, role in the governorship, the, the unions are working very, very hard for uh, Pritzker's election, that is, Rauner's defeat. So um, while the governor has a great deal of money to spend, uh, he is being outspent by uh, challenger, Pritz, challenger Pritzker. Uh, there was discussion over coffee before you arrived as to whether recent revelations about J.B. Pritzker's property tax uh, incidents uh, would affect his, uh, could affect the development of the campaign between now and November. Uh, I would guess that criticism of J.B. Pritzker for whatever it was he did related to property tax reductions uh, will, will not have a signal impact on the campaign that most persons who are going to vote, and there may not be that many turning out to vote, uh, will uh, have already made up, their, uh, made up their decision, or made their decision. So I will close with that, Dick, and look forward to questions and discussion later about uh, what the 2018 and 2019 elections uh, will and should mean for the state of Illinois. Thank you, Jim. They were a little taller than me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of today's topic. I've known Dick Simpson for years and we've been swimming upstream 
against the status quo for a long time. The upcoming mayor's race next year is truly remarkable because it's the first time in my lifetime that we have a truly open seat. So far, the city's political or business elite hasn't anointed anyone, although there are those who will be quick to claim the mantle. This is a defining moment when we as voters have an opportunity to change the trajectory of Chicago. For the past eight years, we've had a public relations mayor with no vision for the entire city. Downtown and tourists are all he cared about. When Tony Pretwinkle announced for mayor, she said, I'm not anti-downtown, I'm anti-only downtown. I heard the Chicago Tribune architecture critic Blair Kamen describe Mayor Rahm Emanuel as someone who emphasized the linear aspects of the city. For example, the river walk, modernization of the red and purple lines, upgrading the red line, the O'Hara expansion, proposing to bore a hole underground to transport tourists and business people to O'Hare, widening the lakefront trail, the loop the Loop Link bus project, increasing bus lanes, et cetera. You get what I'm saying. Neglect of the city's south and west sides didn't start with Emmanuel. He just continued it. Since 2000, more than 250,000 African Americans have left the city. These are middle class black people who are needed to stabilize communities. They're the ones who could afford to leave. Between the public housing projects being torn down, the 2008 recession, and the closing of 50 neighborhood public schools, what were once thriving, close-knit communities are struggling and riddled with violence. This is Chicago, a city that rebuilt itself after the Great Fire, a city that's the transportation hub of the nation, an, architecture, an architectural marvel one of the most diverse cities in the Midwest, yet our city leaders can't figure out how to create jobs, revitalize communities, provide a good education, and stop the violence citywide. I hear people say, well, at least Mayor Richard Daley loved the city. The decline of the city's neighborhoods started with Mayor Daley. Yes, he built new schools, but at the expense of neighborhood schools and police and fire stations, and libraries. But it wasn't for the neighborhood residents. It was for his friends in the construction industry. This is how he kept them working. This is how he kept them and their families voting for him. He spent $100 million on wrought iron fences that went to one company, GF Structures. Daily put fences around schools, parks, playgrounds, and even trees. When he exhausted selling off the city's assets, failed to get the Olympics, and there was nothing left to give his friends, Daley decided he would not run for re-election. This very minute, there are protesters in front of 10 hotels fighting for a livable wage and health benefits. Meanwhile, there are a record number of cranes dotting the city skyline. The unions are divided between the building trades who love Daly and Emmanuel, and the service trades who are struggling to survive. That's the kind of divisive politics that goes on in Chicago. That keeps people at the bottom, on the bottom, fighting each other, while those on the top thrive and enjoy all the beauty Chicago has to offer. We need another neighborhood mayor like Harold Washington. Just consider how far the black community, and as a result, the city, has fallen since Washington's death 32 years ago. In 1987, there were six Chicago black-owned banks. Today, there's none. This was the black publishing capital of the world. Today, one of the most successful black-owned publishing companies, Johnson's, no longer exists. This was the home of black hair care manufacturers. At one time, there were more black millionaires per capita in Chicago than any other city. What was once the land of opportunity for working class black people 100 years ago has very little to offer. We need to support a candidate for mayor 
who can articulate a vision for the city that will transform our neighborhoods. Someone who supports progressive revenue sources that will make Chicago a sustainable and livable city for all. Everyone knows how to offer ideas for regressive revenue streams, taxes, casinos, layoffs, et cetera, but have no vision when it comes to projects that will be a catalyst for growth on the south and west sides of Chicago. <clears throat> it's easy for experts and sociologists to blame segregation for the city's problems, but at one time these same communities were full of working class people who took pride in their homes, families, and schools. Segregation isn't the, isn't the reason for concentrated poverty. Petty parochial politics embraced by the city's most powerful is the reason. As a result, the city's population con continues to decline. Crime is spreading across the city like a plague. And the increasing costs to run the city, borne by a shrinking number of residents, seems insurmountable. Yesterday on Chicago Tonight, Jesus Garcia said of the current candidates for mayor that everyone now likes to call himself or herself a progressive, but not everyone is. When Carol Marine asked if the following people, Susanna Mendoza, Gary McCarthy, Paul Vallis were progressive, he said no. When asked about Troy LaRavier, he answered yes. When asked about Tony Preckwinkle, Garcia said she enjoys the reputation of a progressive, but he would need to see how bold someone will be, will truly, will be truly to determine if he or she has a vision for bringing Chicago together, healing it, unifying it, and creating the conditions for prosperity for all the neighborhoods, not a continuation of the status quo. This is a defining moment for Chicago. We can turn around our city if we have the political will. As Garcia said, not everyone who's claiming to be a progressive is a progressive. I always say it doesn't matter if someone is a first-time candidate or a veteran. Everybody has a record, whether it's in the private sector or public sector. As voters, we owe it to ourselves to do our homework we spend more time researching and rating restaurants than we do elected officials. We cannot fall for the okie doke. If we truly love this city, this is time for all of us to come together and make a difference. And no, I'm not throwing my hat in the ring for mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Undoubtedly, Del Murray would make a great candidate for mayor, but we'll have to wait for another time. <laughs> So I want to do a little bit of uh, elaboration on both the 2018 election and the 2019 election on topics that our other panelists haven't covered. And if you have questions, please write them on the cards and we'll pick them up in just a moment. So I want to start with the congressional elections in Illinois. The balance of the Illinois delegation in Congress now is 11 Democrats and seven Republicans. We have 18 congressmen from Illinois. Uh, there are four key races, two of them that were shown on Chris's map, uh, that are in play, uh, in which the so-called switch from red to blue might happen. We're not expecting any to switch from blue to red, but there are a couple of places where that is at least possible. The four races are, uh, I'll give just the names of the Democratic challengers. Uh, Chris gave the names of two of the Republican um, incumbents. But they're in the 6th District, essentially the DuPage County-ish area, which is Sean Caston uh, is running. The 12th District downstate, which is down at East St. Louis in that area, when Brendan Kelly is running. The 13th District, uh, which is where Urbana is, uh, the Betsy Dirksen Lundgren uh, is running. And the 14th District, uh, which is uh, Lauren Underwood. If two of those races turn out that the Democrats win, I think we can predict fairly safely that the House of Representatives will turn over and the Democrats will win it. I won't go into all the reasons that's true, uh, but it would be a trend that would be happening in other states. And as you know, the Democrats need 23 seats in the House of Representatives and two in the Senate to change the balance of power uh, in the Congress of the United States. And just to give you an idea of the magnitude of those, I don't have time to go through all of it. I'm going to much more on the mayor and aldermen. 
It, uh, those races, the candidates will raise and spend more than $2 million each uh, to win those seats. Some will spend a good bit more than that. But I wanted to particularly also talk about UIC. Um, 2014 was the comparable election. It was a non-presidential election. 2016 is a presidential election. We did great in the 2016 election. We registered more than 1,000 more students. We voted at 55%. We're credited as being one of the biggest change around universities in voter registration and in voter student voting because of the 2016 election and the work that's done by all sorts of groups on campus to make that possible. The question is, will that happen in 2018? And I have to say the bar is set incredibly low. In 2014, I'll assume that the students in the audience weren't here then, um, otherwise you're probably on a six year, or seven year degree program which isn't as much fun. Uh, we only had 19% of the students vote. 19% of the students at UIC voted, and that's generally true across the country at all universities as an average. The national program is just to increase the voting from 19 to 29%. If that happened nationally, two million more students would be voting in this election than voted in 2014, and there would be a dramatic change because they'd be spread all over the country. We're hoping here at UIC to register up to more than 1,000 new voters. We're pretty much on track to do that, but we only have a few days left. The final day for paper re-registration is October 9th, and the final day uh, for electronic uh, registration is, I think it's the 22nd or 23rd of October. It's only a, a couple of weeks afterwards. So if we're gonna register more students, we have to do it now. But more important than just whether we register students is whether or not we're going to vote and that's going to require a much bigger effort. Now, let me talk about the 2019 elections very briefly, and then we'll go to the debate, discussions, questions that you have. Uh, as you know, there are at the moment, we think, uh, 17 candidates for mayor, so you have plenty to choose from. But in truth, there are only six major candidates at the moment. Uh, the six are Tony Preckwinkle, Lori Lightfoot, Bill Daly, Paul Vallis, Gary McCarthy, and Gary Chico. There can be some argument about that. The fact that Chewy, decided not, Chewy Garcia decided not to run, uh, he would have been a major candidate if he had run. Uh, there's some others who would have perhaps reached that status. But it means we're going to have a wide range of visions, uh, like Del Marie was talking about, where do we plan to go in Chicago, Why, how do we plan to get there, how do we fix things, and the choice for mayor is important. Why are there only, if there are 17 candidates running around, why are there only six or so that we should think of as candidates as we're making our assessment of them? To run for mayor, you have to raise approximately $5 million. That's not just to throw money in the air, that's what it takes to get the message to the voters, whether you're buying TV ads, you're putting a full campaign staff together, opening multiple headquarters, sending direct mail, phone banking, and so forth. Um, for run for alderman in the 50 ward, you have to raise a quarter of a million dollars, $250,000. Yes, if you really know what you're doing, you can shave it a little and get by with a little less, but let's say you want to run for $10,000 or $15,000. When I first ran for alderman and got elected in 1971, I spent $25,000. There's no way in hell that a candidate is going to win with $25,000 as an alderman unless there's a really strange fluke uh, related to that particular election. While there may be 17 candidates for mayor at the moment, we don't know that all will get on the ballot. There are two, more than 250 candidates for alderman. In the 47th Ward, I understand there are 11 candidates at the moment. Now, they will shuffle out a bit. Uh, and I'll tell you why. They do have to get 500 signatures on the ballot, and not all of them will even make that small uh, threshold. But the mayor has to get 12,500 valid signatures on the ballot, which means 25,000 signatures in practice. If you're running for alderman, you have to have a professional staff of at least three people, usually your campaign manager, your office manager, and your PR person. Um, this just isn't something that's simple to do. Petitions are due the week of Thanksgiving, essentially, and elections are February 26th, and then the runoff elections are April 2nd in 2019. 
So this is something that's fast approaching. So we have two elections sort of running on top of each other, um, which is wonderful for those of us who teach political science. We have plenty of topics to talk about. Uh, but it is confusing to try and mount a campaign, let's say for mayor or for alderman, at the same time people are wondering about the governor's race, in some cases state legislative races. This is, as Delmarie tended to point out, perhaps a defining election. The national election, as I started with the congressional uh, races, the four that are really in play in Illinois, uh, are probably going to be defined mostly as pro or anti-Trump. You're either with the president or opposed to the president for this, that, or the other reason, and you're able to motivate your voters to come out and vote. It's not just None of these elections turn on the views of 51% of the population. Doesn't matter what the population thinks. All that matters in an election is who showed up on election day. And that is usually a pretty small number. In this election, you certainly would figure that not more than 25 or so percent are gonna vote. Maybe a little higher, might get to 30%. That means you can win an election with say 15% of the voters if your voters got there. And it varies when there's a more contested election than the, the percent of voters goes up in that particular district. So the final question, uh, in Chicago, I think the um, uh, mayor and aldermanic elections will pretty much turn along the themes that Delmarie was talking about. I think it will be, do we want to continue the status quo? Things are going well. We did this, that, and the other. Aren't you happy with your new block, your new street, your new garbage can, whatever? You know, the, the incumbents, whoever the alderman or the mayor will say, and in, in this case, it's in, since Rahm Emanuel's not running, whoever is running will say, I will do everything Rahm Emanuel did, but I'll do it more efficiently and better. Uh, or is there gonna be a fundamental change, uh, what might be called the building a new Chicago? And if so, what's that vision in concrete terms? What does it mean to build a new Chicago? What, what projects would be undertaken and where would we get the revenue? One of the reasons Rahm Emanuel probably didn't run is he thought about what the next four years will be like. And I'll just give you one example uh, to end with because I do want to get to questions. And that is just to pay the new pension costs is going to cost us a billion dollars more a year. Any of you who are property tax owners in Chicago have probably seen your new property tax bill, or you will. I hope you're sitting down when you get it. The smallest increase is about 20% in most cases. Several people are getting several hundred percent increase in their property taxes because of all the things we have to pay for by all the different governments. Add to that a couple of years from now when your property tax bill will have to absorb a billion dollars in new costs, not for any service, not for any new project, but to pay the pension costs, just in the city of Chicago. The second question would be, what would a new Illinois look like? What would it be like, for instance, to regularly have a functioning state and to have a state budget and to have the university funded each year <laughs> and to have students available to get their MAP grants? Not all our students can get MAP grants because there's not That's enough great. money in the MAP fund and so on and so forth. You can just go down the list. What would a new vitalized economy where we weren't losing people from Chicago and Illinois look like, where people wanted to live in Chicago and Illinois, and not just the, we the very wealthy to live down in the big condos downtown? So the elections of 2018 and 2019 are important. What happens at UIC in terms of those elections are important, and it's time to make those choices and not to just make those choices in an abstract sense, I like so-and-so, but to make those choices in terms of money, work, motivating other people to participate in the elections. So if you have questions, please pass them up, and please thank our panelists for their presentations. <laughs> questions? We all have mics so we can sit and take your questions. So uh, particularly uh, Adele Marie, I think, but maybe some of the others, could you talk more about the difference between linear versus nonlinear uh, uh, programs and uh, revenue streams of where we should get money in the new period? Well, first of all, uh, the, you know, we are talking about the progressive income tax. 
that's something that's been discussed and continue, needs to continue to be discussed. Also, uh, financial transaction tax is something that we've talked about for years. And um, no matter how much we talk about them, for whatever reason, uh, no one seems to have the political will to try to get them done. Uh, instead, they look for what I call regressive revenue streams, which are casinos and taxes. And casinos, while that sounds great, oh, we'll have a, you know, all this money will come in, the only people that's going to hurt are poor people. Uh, I did a study of the lottery and, by zip code and take 628, for example, which is Roseland. In Roseland, $30 million a year is spent on the lottery. So imagine $30 million a year going into Roseland instead of going out of Roseland. That's what we need to look at. When we look at video gaming, the, the communities that have an income of 75000 and above opted out of video gaming, while the poor communities opted in. So that is how this is set up, that we can always find good revenue ideas when it comes to the backs of poor people boring, uh, bearing the brunt. But we can never come up with good revenue ideas when it comes to rich people paying just a little bit more. Uh, David Moore, who's an alderman in the 17th Ward and who's one of my clients, um, the, when he first got in office, he won the last election, he uh, came up with the idea of just adding $2 more to the room tax for the tourists since Mayor Rahm Emanuel was bragging about how many new tourists we had. We had 55 you know, million tourists that came to Chicago. So he's like, okay, we'll add $2 to their room stay per visit, not per night, per visit. Fell on deaf ears. Those are the kinds of ideas we need to come up with. If you want tours and you think tours are the answer for everything, then let the tours bear some of the problems of the city and not just let the people who live here and the tourists come here and enjoy it for a week and we're the ones struggling for the other 50 week, 51 weeks. Okay, we have a bunch of other questions. I'll take this to Chris and Jim. Uh, what demographic changes will most impact Illinois politics in the mid and long term run? Go ahead. I think the obvious one is the rise of the Latino population uh, around the state and, uh, and probably uh, the reduction that Del Marie was talking about in African American population, certainly in the city, but uh, I mean, where I live down in Bronzeville, there was a, what, 100,000 people lived there in 1990, like 30,000 live there now. Uh, it's nice and quiet, uh, but it's not, very, uh, it's not very good for the long-term vibrancy. So I think, yeah, I think the, the rise of the Latinx people and Jim? so forth. There's been a lot of demographic change over the past decades. People don't appreciate that in the past two or three decades, there's been a net out-migration of about two million whites from the state of Illinois. Probably middle age and older going to the south and southwest largely. Uh, that out-migration probably will continue as older folks tend to be better off than other folks and have the resources to move to warmer clime. Uh, another demographic downstate uh, is that, uh, and it's related to white population, uh, rural population continues to decline and that will um, affect voting, uh, but probably the net out migration of whites is one of the reasons the state has gone from balanced politically to, uh, to a blue state. So one of the questions that's uh, somehow related is, will the Brett Kavanaugh controversy affect the midterm elections? Will it cause Republican voters to come out to the polls? Well, if you look at um, the, the, the presidential election in 2016, they said 20% of those people who voted came out because of the Supreme Court um, and makeup. And so if you figure 20% 20, 20 of Trump's people who came out at the very end and voted for him voted because of the makeup of the Supreme Court, they thought Hillary Clinton would make the Supreme Court more liberal, then this is certainly is going to give them incentive to come out to protect uh, Brett Kavanaugh. 
Uh, but the other part of that is, uh, or someone like him, but the other part of that is that this is also an incentive for those who didn't come out. You see them more engaged. I mean, in, in the past, uh, what you talked about earlier, Democrats voted every four years and Republicans voted every two years. That's how, how Republicans wound up getting control of every body of government in the country. And so they have strategically done that. Now we've learned the lesson, and now we're stepping up. And I think that's what you're going to see. So I think it's going to be hard to tell. I think it's going to be, uh, a, it's going to be a good thing for both sides, probably. I'll take this question, and others can comment if they want. Uh, with Mayor Emanuel not running again, is the machine patronage system officially dead? As you know, Harold Washington declared it dead, dead, dead <laughs> back in 1983, but it was a little premature. Um, <laughs> The uh, patronage system was at its height under Richard J. Daley, and the, the uh, uh, patronage cases that were decided by courts uh, back at the t in that time, uh, they uh, figured that maybe as around 35,000 patronage jobs existed in Chicago and the other local and uh, the state government part that's in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, in the clout list under the Sorich trial under Richard M. Daly, that had dropped to 5,000. That number has dropped more because local government has cut the number of people that work for local government and people have retired. That is, there are literally fewer jobs. So that um, the patronage system is not totally dead. Rahm Emanuel in Daly, before him, substituted money for some of the patronage uh, because then they could run a presidential style campaign locally and hire consultants and do direct mail and do television. Uh, but the patronage system is still left over and hasn't disappeared entirely. I'll ask each of the panelists uh, the question from the audience, who would you vote for for mayor and governor? And start with Jim Down, even though Jim can't vote for mayor. <laughs> I will have to vote for J.B. Pritzker, not because I think he's a dynamic, attractive, strong candidate, but because I am so offended by the ineffective governorship of uh, Governor Rauner. And I won't say, sorry. Okay, Bill Murray. Um, I would vote for Pritzker. I'm going to vote for Pritzker, but I do, do think that we need to be asking for something from him and not just have him anybody asking him for anything. Uh, he's not really articulating a vision. I would vote for Pritzker and uh, then for Mayor Lori Lightfoot. Um, there are two quick questions. Why can you only sign perhaps for one candidate in a race, uh, that is the petitions to get them on the ballot, and does it politically dampen voter involvement? Uh, the short answer is you can only sign for one candidate because that's the law. Uh, so there's no choice about, you can sign as many petitions as you want, but only one signature will count. And it's the first one which is notarized by the date of the notary stamp on the petition is how it's actually resolved in terms of actual cases. Uh, does it uh, dampen voter involvement? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, a lot of voter involvement comes later than the petition stage, so I don't think it's a major factor in people not turning out to vote. Um, I'll let the, the rest of you answer this next one. How are House candidates who will be supported by the party selected, that is how are the Democrats, Republicans, the Green Party, and so forth, and can an outsider candidate win a primary in Illinois? When I ran for the Illinois House, once unsuccessfully, twice successfully, I first had to go to the five county chairman of the Republican Party in my downstate district and seek their support. Uh, that was uh, the practical thing to do because they tended to have influence over voters in low turnout primaries. Today, uh, you, uh, if you want to run for the legislature, uh, the party, uh, chairs, uh, if you go to them, because many party chairs are uh, ineffective anymore at turning out vote, that they ask you, how much money can you raise? 
money has replaced the party organization in most settings in uh, American politics. I'll just stop there, Chris. Uh, well, let me raise the point of, uh, there was two points in there, right? Yeah, can an outsider candidate win a primary? Yeah, and I would say that, that absolutely. There's no doubt that an outsider candidate can win a primary. It happens every election. Uh, a, a good example would be a woman named Carol Ammons, who is in the state house right now. She's out of her, uh, her champagne, right? Mm -hmm. Champagne, and uh, and she just went out. She's very she's very left wing, very progressive. Uh, the and it was an open seat. Uh, the person wasn't going to run again in the, their house seat uh, four years ago. And uh, the the spe the party, the speakers, you know, party, the ca House Democratic Caucus backed a particular person that they thought was going to win, and she just went out and took it. And that's uh, most or many many people in the legislature. Are people, and I don't know about the, all the manic seats, but they're just people that just went out and took it. Now, you can't go out and win a seat if all the fundamental institutional, if the structure is against you. You can't, you, you know, I, I'm, if I'm, again, I'm living down here and I decide I'm going to be a Republican and I'm going to run for state legislature, it, it's just not going to happen because you're like a, I always tell, I tell my students, it's like you're like a water bug on an ocean. You know, a lot of big forces and you're kind of working hard. But if you're in this, you know, if you're in the groove, sometimes it can happen. So uh, just a couple of last questions. Um, any creative ways Chicago or Illinois can attract more U.S. citizens to come to our state? Del Marie, you haven't answered for a while. You want to take that one? Yeah, uh, uh, make, uh, make the opportunities for jobs. Uh, that's why people jobs and good paying jobs and people come for good schools and so if you have those things people and people want safe streets uh, if you have those things in place people will come and and what we're watching is a place like uh, Houston Houston is getting ready to surpass uh, Chicago in terms of population I mean when you think of that that is just unbelievable and Going back to one of the other things that you were talking about in terms of population loss, we went from 20 congressional seats to 18 congressional seats, and all, in all likelihood, we're going to go to 16 congressional seats. Uh, so when you talk about population loss, you're talking about representation, you're talking about all of that is at stake. And so that's what happens, and we've got to start looking at these things more broadly to understand what all of this means in terms of are having a good life. Yes, Jim. I would probably take more of a Main Street Republican posture on this than would Del Marie. I, I think first at the state level, uh, it's critical that we stabilize the budget situation, uh, primarily because business wants stability and predictability. And if it does not see that, it will not locate and, and expand if it doesn't know what the likelihood of tax burden is going to be five years down the pike. So that, uh, that is one factor. And business climate uh, is another. And the CEO magazine regularly ranks Illinois as 48th, 49th, or 50th. Now that may not be fair. I don't think it is. But is a businessman or woman going to listen to Jimmy Nolan or to the peers who uh, read that magazine? So that's the second thing we need to address, and we don't have time for me to uh, yeah. lecture on it, but uh, those are factors. Yeah, I agree with both of those points, and, and particularly the business climate thing. And, and the, the, the people of, from day one, uh, Europeans have come to Illinois to make money. That's the only reason. Nobody comes here because of the great dramatic vistas and the beautiful views. It's to make money. Abraham Lincoln came here to make money. So uh, it's not like people go to Colorado for the beautiful place or they go to Houston. Who knows why they're going well, out of Houston? Going uh, because uh, of jobs. Yeah, well, exactly. It's jobs, right? And they don't want to, you know, the weather is not good. It's not helping us. Uh, uh, but if you know, there's no jobs, nobody's going to come here. 
Let me add to that, we're down in the mouth in Illinois generally about our prospects when we fail mm -hmm. to appreciate the strengths that we have. Illinois has more miles of interstate highways than any state other than California or Texas. You look at a map, the dense internet or the web of interstates in Illinois is richer than in any state in the nation. All seven major railroads come into and out of Chicago. A quarter of all containers go into and out of Chicago. MIT recently ranked O'Hare as the best uh, American airport for domestic and international flights. Uh, water. Uh, educated workforce. We have a higher percentage of persons with bachelor's degrees than most states do. And uh, so we have strengths, we don't talk about them, we're so down in the mouth. But that's exactly what I was saying earlier, is that this is Chicago. I mean, look at all the resources we have, and, and yet we are not capitalizing on them. In fact, we're losing, and there is no way in a competitive situation we should be losing population. I, I agree. Thank you very much to our panelists, and uh, thanks to the audience for being here today.